Earl R.C. Thomas, and I was on mute. Didn't realize that. <laughs> like Beyonce says, everybody on mute except for me. Anyway, I'll start that again. This is Marcy, your girl from Brown Girl Collective and the BGC Book Club. I want to say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from and when you're joining us. And I just want to thank you for being in this space where we always share wonderful books that are by, for, and about Black women. And tonight is no exception. I'm really super excited about this guest because her book talks about a place where I once lived and spent some time as a young person and my mother lived for many years as well. So I really cannot die, wait to dive into it. So at the moment, I'm coming to you from the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia, originally from Cleveland, Ohio. So if you don't mind in your first time here or you've been here before, you let us know where you're joining us from. That'd be really great so we can get a feel for who all is in the room. So tonight's special guest is Delana R.A. Dameron, who is an artist whose primary medium is storytelling. She is a graduate of New York University's MFA program in poetry and holds a BA degree in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her debut poetry collection, How God Ends Us, was selected by Elizabeth Alexander for the South Carolina Poetry Book Prize. And her second collection, Weary Kingdom, was chosen by Nikki Finney for the Palmetto Poetry Series. She is also the founder of Saloma Acres, an equestrian and cultural space in her hometown in South Carolina, which is Columbia, where she currently resides. And tonight we're going to be talking about Redwood Court. So without any further delay, let's go ahead and bring our special guest into the space. Welcome, Delana. Welcome. So glad to Hi. have you here. Yes, thank you so much. So oh, yes. Happy to be here. Yes, and it's such a thrill. And before we get too far, I have to give a shout out to our mutual friend, Christina Smith-Galloway, who told me about your book, several months before it came out. And I just am so excited that we were able to get you here. And we see we've got Erica joining us from Louisville or Louisville, depending on <laughs> how you choose to say it. And then we also have a guest joining us from the DMV. So welcome. So first of all, congratulations. This is your debut novel. Yes. Yep. So how does that feel after doing poetry? How does it feel to be in the novel space at this point? Yeah, I um, have always been writing in multiple genres. Um, my poetry even is very narrative or story centric. Um, and so I don't feel like this is much of, the, of a departure from my work in poetry. Um, rather, I get more room to explore the stuff that I obsess over, right? Mm -hmm. um, and certainly it feels it is a physically bigger <laughs> book right. than poetry collections but at the heart of it and and during the writing of it it was probably the difference between a marathon and a sprint right mm. less, less so for me like m two completely distinct genres Okay. Okay. Well, that, that is fair, you know, that it's something that you've been doing anyway. And I do know that there are stories or parts of the book that were written as stories prior to you putting the book together anyway. So this is something that you've been, you know, mulling around for quite a while. Yeah. And um, several of the obsessions, several of the themes, several of the ideas you might also find hints in my poetry collections, right? Mm. Like, um, I forget who says it, but there's a saying that we, writers write our obsessions. And my obsession happens to be both my family and the everyday lived experiences of Black Southern folks. And so, mm. you know, it shows up in my poetry. It shows up in my prose. It shows up in the way I walk through the world. <laughs> um, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a Southern novel. And as I mentioned in the introduction and told you, I lived in Columbia for a couple of years, so I could relate to some of the places that you mentioned and some of the restaurants, you know, just different things. Like, oh, I could relate to it. Yeah. And I love that because I can't honestly say in, in many of the books that I've read that I've really seen Columbia show up in this way. So I love the fact that you included, you know, your, your city in the book in that way. Yeah, I really wanted 
the story that I was interested in telling to be rooted in a real place. Um, mm -hmm. I think it is connected to my work as a historian, my interests in history, and thinking about a future moment, right, that might exist without me or you in it, um, but someone would find Redwood Court and understand that there were real people um, living in a real place. Um, and particularly what I've been finding with Black Southern literature is that, you know, folks will tell Southern Black stories if it's more urban in our known mm -hmm. epicenters, right? So your Atlantas, your New Orleans, your Memphis. And if it goes into the rural side um, of the Black Southern experience, often we find they are made up places, mm -hmm. um, That's true. fabricated That's true. places. Mm -hmm. And both, right, like being from Columbia, growing up in Columbia uh, is more suburban than probably an an urban versus rural dichotomy. Um, so that was never, I hadn't experienced that as reading black literature. Um, and, you know, just thinking that for so many people, Columbia is such an unknown entity. Mm -hmm. I had no reason to make it up. <laughs> right, right, right. That's true, that's true. Um, um, okay, your ancestral land is just north of Columbia in Kershaw County, you know, Camden. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing when you said that, a lot of people's experience with Columbia is going to the military base. They were yep. stationed there because they were stationed there in the army or they went there for basic training. So that's where a lot of people know Columbia from. So it is good to see like a different side of it. So Redwood Court is a real place. Yes, in okay. a real city. Yep. So is it, is it a place that your family connects to or just people that you knew? Or how did you determine that Redwood Court would be the place that you would center your story? So Redwood Court is the cul-de-sac in a neighborhood called Newcastle here in Columbia, wherein my grandparents lived out the bulk of their lives. Um, and I spent a lot of time with my grandparents on Redwood Court. Um, and yeah, I just thought it was a great place to explore the truths of what it meant to be a Black girl growing up in suburban Black South in the 90s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a little, little autobiographical, a little, a little. Um, there are parallels, yes. Okay. Uh, but what I like to say or use in as, as an example, are you familiar with the um, Netflix television show, The Crown? I am. So you know that the so we know that the crown is a fictionalized version of the royal family, right? Mm -hmm. um, it uses real people, um, avatars of real people and real names. Um, it'll it uses many public cultural events that we are familiar with. Um, but what makes it a work of fiction or narrative drama for us as viewers and experiences is that we get the interiority of the royal family, right? We get what the royal mail doesn't give us. And um, there's leaps that happen between what we know and what we don't know. And I use that as my model as well for Redwood Court. So while there are things that might mirror, right, some of my lived experiences and people that I know, um, I make several leaps in between yeah. the knowns and the unknowns. Um, so I would not, this is not a work of autobiography, um, but, you know, really interested in, in the truths. Like I said, the truths, not necessarily the accuracy of what it is to navigate a black suburban South in the nineties as a young black girl. Yes, yes. Okay, we got somebody joining us from Houston. So yeah, I see a lot of South of the South yeah, represented in the room. So I love that. So for those who haven't had a chance to read Redwood Court yet, um, just a synopsis of what the story is about. Um, so it's a coming of age story, um, like I said, of a Black girl growing up in Columbia, South Carolina, very 
solidly situated in the 90s. And it's also a collective story of the people who raised her, um, particularly her grandparents. Um, it's And also intergenerational. So you see three generations of this family traveling through time together um, and all of the ways in which, you know, the beautiful struggles happen for for folks like them um, during one of the biggest cultural moments in our history, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I do love the fact that, I mean, the story kind of starts out with our, our main character, um, Mika, kind of, she's that person who's always probably places where she shouldn't be listening to, <laughs> listening to what other people are talking about, and she's curious, and she wants to know, and then she has a certain you know, skill set where she likes to write and she likes to journal and things like that. So she has this desire to know more about who her people are. And, and I love that. I love seeing that. Yeah. And it starts from, you know, uh, what could be seen to be a very innocent school project, right? Mm-hmm. And she was tasked with bringing into class an artifact that represented the country with which her family emigrated from to these United States, right? right. <laughs> and knowing that she was a descendant of the institution of American slavery, she understood very early the impossibility of that task, mm-hmm. right? And so she started, you know, she knew she couldn't complete it. She didn't have right. the answer. So then she started to go to her family members for that answer, recognizing that her family members didn't have that answer. Um, and there's this moment where Tita, her grandfather, you know, is like, yeah, yeah, do the, do the assignment, but also know that like somebody made those things at some point in their family timeline to, for it to become an artifact for the, for that person to be able to bring it in. And so he encouraged her to think about what it might mean to make the artifacts. Right. Mm -hmm. And so she leans into the storytellers of her family um decided to be to be the artifacts that she's that she's thinking of all right and uh, i mean so many things come up just even in that explanation is that first of all as i was reading i'm realizing yeah a lot of times we don't know most of the time we don't know where we can say you know without a doubt where we come from right but you know i love the fact that in in the book, in spite of them not maybe not be, really being able to pinpoint at that point of the story, that they came up with another solution. So she didn't have to feel like she was left out and being able to tell her story. So that's one thing. The other thing is the importance of sitting and having these conversations oftentimes with our elders, because how many of our stories get lost, how much information about our family and our, our trials and triumphs get lost because we're not having those conversations. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And I think one of the things, again, thinking of myself um, as someone who's deeply interested in history um, and always thinking of the timeline, and I feel like the 90s as a decade was one of the last decades that we had as a collective folks, and I mean, you know, Black folks descendant from the institution of American slavery and wherein we might've lived during the same timeline of someone who was one to two generations removed Mm -hmm. from that. And I think that the ways in which that informed community care, Mm -hmm. the ways in which that informed um, collective upbringing of the children, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, the ways in which it informed just our walking through the world, right? Like, and we'll never get that moment again. We'll never get that moment again. That's true. Because things have changed. You know, we're so dispersed nowadays. And, you know, like one of the things that we we can get into this now, just the fact that when um, 
when Tita and Wheezy bought this house, the whole thing was it for it to be a, like a communal space, a space where the family would come together. But not only that, that they would have relationships with their neighbors in the community. And nowadays we've kind of gotten away from that. We A lot of times we don't even know who our neighbors are. Definitely not by name, you know, definitely not in a way where we're actually, you know, coming together and, you know, supporting one another and they, they are becoming an extension of our own families. That doesn't really happen anymore. Yeah, no, I have not experienced that in a community in any of my residences since, right. and I didn't even live at Redwood Court, right? But I still felt <laughs> right. as if that I was very much a part of that community. Yeah. Right. And that, that just makes such a difference. And it's, it's kind of sad, actually. It is sad that we have lost, you know, those types of connections. So in like reading the story, I loved it, you know, seeing how, you know, sometimes people might, the neighbors might have thought that, you know, Wheezy, who's who's uh, Mika's grandmother, I, mean, I thought she was nosy or whatever, but it wasn't nosy just for the sake of being nosy. <laughs> right. There was a thing of like caring and we are a community and we are here to support one another. It was an asset for Wheezy, right? So she knew who had what, who could, she knew who could deploy what at whatever hour of need when the need even before the need presented itself, right? Mm -hmm. Or it might've presented itself, but before that person felt that they needed to ask for it because she already knew, you know, someone's falling behind on their mortgage. Let's, you know, go around and, and keep them here on the court or, you know, just the ways in which she stayed in what we call, what I called the middling space of her mm -hmm. neighbors really became her expression of community care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. And I also love in the book that, you know, oftentimes when we have books uh, that are written by women that have strong female characters, we don't always see the men mm -hmm. categorized or, or characterized, I should say, in, in a, such a strong way. And Tita, the grandfather, he is a very important character in the book. And I, I really love seeing that because I was close to my grandfather. So, you know, I could relate to that. So how important was it for you to make sure that you included that male voice or that male perspective in telling the story? Yeah, we get two generations of that, right? Like you get Tita and then you get his son-in-law, Major, um, who's Mika's father. Um, out of three generations and then Uncle Junior. Um, I, it was very important for me to weigh both the matriarchal and the patriarchal sides of this family as equally as I could with the amount of time we get with, with those characters, right? Um, I think that so often you're right, like we get um, books that have a heavy um, motherly presence and often that's at the expense of um, a heavy, male presence. And while that is oftentimes an experience that is within our community, um, I also wanted to depict one wherein, you know, to the best of their abilities, it stays as intact as possible, right? And what that could mean for the people that they raised, the children that they raised. Um, and also to say that that's not going to stop you know, family members from being lost from that, <laughs> from that system also, right? Um, but just really, really trying to like coming into someone, coming into the writing of Redwood Court as someone who has been a student of black contemporary literature since, you know, by the time I could read um, mm -hmm. and really wanting to enter into the archive a story and a narrative that I felt didn't exist mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and on multiple levels. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you know, this is my kind of answer, answer to that. And I, I love that because I mentioned my grandfather, but I was very close to my father as well. I, I cannot not say that. I was I'm definitely a daddy's girl. girl. Yes. Yeah, daddy's, girl. <laughs> daddy's not here anymore, but I, I'm still a daddy's girl. He's not even Thanks. here. 
it's 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 an identity that stays with you regardless. It's, it's, it's an identity because I mean, just real quick sidebar. You know, all these books, all this reading, even me doing this is an extension of my father instilling in me a love of reading. So yeah, he's with me even though he's not with me. So mm -hmm. you know, whenever I can see that, you know, in a story or in a book, I love to see that as well because things are not always one-sided in that regard. Um, but yes, yeah, just really being able to see that and see what's happening in the family and throughout the family and just black culture, black Southern culture in general, <laughs> you know, that, that you really tap into that. Like I was telling you, teasing you right before we came live that you have a part in there where people are talking about playing space. I don't play space. Y'all don't take my black card. I do not. <laughs> it's okay. I don't, play okay. space. I don't play, you know, I just didn't in college or whatever. I didn't really pick those things up. And in my family, they weren't necessarily, we would get, get together and play Uno, stuff like that. But we weren't necessarily playing, you know, some of the other games, Bid Whist or Spades, like a lot of families do. But I love how even in that, in the book, you talk about it and how every family or every, you know, um, set of people has their own way of doing things. <laughs> oh, yes. Very, it can be very divisive um, in terms of how folks play, if they play with wilds. Um, but I think at the heart of it is, you know, just a very widespread cultural experience for many folks, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't fault folks who don't know how to play spades. They didn't have the privilege of, you know, <laughs> going through the journey of what it meant to be a distant observer as a young kid, right? To then like being close to the elders at the table playing to then, and, and this is how you learn. No one sits you down and teaches you, right? You're just watching as it's, ex as it's happening. Um, and then you get to be a scorekeeper. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, you know, you get to just really be at the right side of someone who's playing. Um, I never got to play with my grandparents. Oh, but, wow. <laughs> but I, I, I play very similar to the ways in which I watched them for years. Oh, play. wow. Yeah, I love that. But, you know, it just speaks to things that are oftentimes a part of our, our culture that, you know, you kind of take for granted. But, you know, just reading that and seeing that, uh, that, that I thought it was funny to read it being like, ooh, I, I still don't know. But <laughs> well, also, music plays a big part in the yeah. book as well. This is taking place in the 90s. And, you know, I love that you, you know, some of the chapters have, you know, song titles or, or refer to the music that's popular at the yep. time. Yep. So I love seeing that as well. It was, um, I feel very blessed to have experienced the 90s at the time in which I did, right? So enough to remember it, not enough to be completely completely um i don't know i find that like the generation right right above me navigates the world differently because they got to experience how great i feel like the 90s was and then it the bottom fell out i guess um but i got to i got to just watch i got to watch and i got to experience all the fun stuff without adult responsibilities during the 90s so lots of great music Mm -hmm. um that and and still motown was big at the same time right like right. so it was a confluence of well, yeah i just i can i continue to say we'll never get that moment the 90s back yeah, we will and i was a young adult in the 90s so yes it was a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> You know, the music was good, you know, you had a lot of bands, you had a lot of, well, actually bands were starting to kind of fizzle out at that point, like bands like Earth, Wind & Fire and stuff like that. But you did have a whole lot of, you know, like the girl groups and, and the guy groups and, you know, New Jack Swing and all these different things. So yeah, it was definitely a fun time to be a young adult and out and in the, in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know, but, yeah, but 
<laughs> I will have to admit that. But um, yeah, I just really like the fact that you did pick up on that. But then also just talking about that time frame, there are points where you're talking about like music videos and like one of the characters, Sissy, she's not necessarily into all the R and B. She's into mm -hmm. some of the rock and some of the other sorts of music. So I know, you know, just even from my own experience with like MTV and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you could kind of get a mixture of everything. Yeah, and I think that that is true for Mika's character as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, that she lived in the same household with parents who blasted Motown, with, you know, the, the upsurgence of MTV and music videos, which in the 90s was diversifying, right, um, in terms of the music that they played. Um, and, and then an older sister who exactly was really interested in classic rock and Alanis Morissette, right? Like exactly, <laughs> um, as Christina just said, um, and Mika, you know, is conflicted with, with, I think that confluence, right? Like starting her journey in Redwood Court, thinking about like, where do I come from? Who are my people? What makes me? Black American and having all of this big swirl of culture um, that she can pick and choose from. And you see her navigating that, particularly when she's at, um, she goes to a, a sleepaway camp and the girls do, you know, a music sing off mm -hmm. and she recognize and it, they separate by race, right? Um, and so the black girls are, are picking black music and the white girls are picking white music. And Mika's like, but I know both. Right. Um, <laughs> but doesn't want to let it be known that she knows both, right? Mm -hmm. um, she kind of gets the classic rock by osmosis through her sister, um, who is completely rejecting a lot of the black cultural references that the family is bringing her up in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that I'm glad that you that you included that because that's true. You know, everyone didn't necessarily go the way that others may have expected to, them to in that regard, especially at that time frame, because for the first time there was a level of freedom that there might not have been with earlier generations in terms of, oh, I'm going to be a part of this group or I'm going to, you know, experience you know, um, life in a different way. So I like the fact that you did include that because that's true. And even the fact, like you just said a moment ago, you know, we're at this camp and like the black kids over here and the white kids over here. I noticed once I got to a certain age in life that started to happen where you might've seen some of the separation. And then at some points it came back together. In some cases it didn't. Yeah, right. And I think that like, again, thinking of the timeline of things and when everyone's walking across this timeline, Mika's parents are children of desegregation, right? They're the children of the promise of equal opportunity. Um, and Mika, again, like what it means to be brought up intergenerationally is raised immediately by those parents where it, and then spends almost all of her free time with family members who knew the Jim Crow South, right? And who knew that, um, who wanted to buy into the promise of desegregation, right? And so push their children through that. Um, and I think in the 90s for them, it was, the slip was starting to show. Right. <laughs> The slip right. was starting to show, um, but not yet for the parents, right? So Mika's major and Rena aren't necessarily bringing her up to be someone who walks through the world as an expressive Black member of the community. It's more about get your education, get, you know, get your, get your stuff, get, do the things that we couldn't do. Right. Um, and so she gets kind of the what it meant to be a black person in the South from her grandparents. Right. Right. And there's a, an instance in the book where they are traveling mm -hmm. 
um, down into Florida, which we know we won't. Yeah, Florida. <laughs> it's and everywhere. It's everywhere. It's they everywhere. just happen to be in Florida. Or just to be the in incident Florida. actually happens in Georgia. Oh, okay. They're on okay. their way to yeah. Florida. Yeah. They're on the way to Florida. And um, there are some things that they still experience, even in this time frame, that are harking back to a different time where people may not feel comfortable being in certain, they didn't feel comfortable being in certain spaces or in certain neighborhoods or certain communities as black people. Even then when you would think that, hey, by then, you know, it should have been a free for all, but you know, not so much. It still isn't in 2024. Right. And that's, and that I think is what, um, is again, the slips, the slip is showing, right? Like, is it, you know, as and I'll speak from my experience kind of outside of Redwood Court. Um, I have been called the N-word more times in New York City when I was a resident of New York City than mm. in South Carolina, right? Like the idea that racism only kind of exists in the South is for me false. <laughs> um, but or that it exists in a specific timeline, right? Mm. That like we we grow out of a timeline of it. And, you know, and so I wanted to highlight that, that mm. like, there is no timeline of escaping it, mm. right? Um, and that the everyday lived experiences of Black Southern folks is we walk, we walk in any space and at any moment, <laughs> it could rear its head. Right. Um, and to think otherwise would be, I don't know. I've never lived, I've never walked through the world like that. So I can't actually say what that right, feel like. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. You go about life and you live and you, you know, you do, you are who you are and you do what you do, but we know, you know, that it could happen and usually catch you off guard when it does because yeah. you're not expecting it. But yes, that's something. But you know, the book is broken down into two, like a part one and a part mm -hmm. two. And in part one, we get a lot of the family history, a lot of the family background, you know, how um, Weezy and Tita wound up on Redwood Court, you know, what's going on with Raina and, um, and Major and, you know, having their children and all those sorts of things. But then there is something that happens near the end of the first part where things shift a little bit. We start to see a different part of this family story. Um, and, you know, there is a loss that is experienced. And so in the second half, we start to see how relationships shift yeah. with that loss. Yeah. I mean, uh, we talked about this. I don't believe that there's any spoilers in Redwood Court. It's not a plot driven story. It is a character driven story um, mm -hmm. that time is the narrative pusher. Right. And in any family, we experience loss throughout time. Um, right. And when I was when I first started thinking about the story I wanted to depict in Redwood Court, it was really the root of it. What could two coming of age stories look like, both for your traditional coming of age, a young black girl in the nineties and a new widow, right? Like her grandmother, like what does it look like to reimagine your life when the person that you spent the majority of your life with is no longer there. And that really informed the second piece, the second half of the book. It's really sort of, I mean, you get a lot more of Mika and then you also get Weezy trying to both recognize that her and Mika were never really like super, super close. They were kind of orbiting each other, but it was Mika and Tita. And now they're having to forge new relationships. They're thinking about family in a different way. Um, they're thinking about who they're going to be in this world without their mutual North Star. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a question from Cleta. What is the age arc of the character coming of age to, throughout the book? So Mika, um, when we meet Mika, in um, the story, how do you know where you're going? Um, she is around seven years old. So, and then the last story, um, Independent Women, um, 
Mika turned 16. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you are right. I mean, she's in the first part, but it's really, it's like she's talking, the things that are being talked, discussed are things that are happening around her. It's not necessarily specifically about what's happening within her. It's a lot of the world that she's orbiting and learning this history and things like that in that first half. Yeah. And then we get to see her go through the things that she would go through as she is, you know, coming of age, so to speak. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So she, in the second half is 13 to 16, mm -hmm. primarily. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we know that, you know, those of us, we've all been through it. Everybody in this space, I believe that, that you know, is a, a woman has been through <laughs> what you go through at that stage of life, you know, figuring out who you are, how you want to show up in the world, the changes that are happening in your body, all of those sorts of things we get to see in that second half. And still navigating grief because she mm -hmm. is grieving the loss of someone that was very she was very close to yeah almost every instant she's like what would tita have done mm -hmm. i know you know tita might have said this um you know the ways in which wheezy she's journeying through wheezy's journey with her because they're still wrapped up together in the same geography of redwood court mm -hmm. she's kind of navigating wheezy's grief as well yeah Mm -hmm. So that that is is something, but I I enjoyed having Mika tell her story just about you know finding out who she wanted to be, um, you know going through things of you know having her first cycle and stuff like that, <laughs> you know, girls go through and, and all of that, and you know and getting more into writing and you know determining who her friends were going to be and all of these sorts of things, and still you know dealing with all of the stuff with the family. Yeah, but you also see you see her like you see a pull of that in the second half, right? You see Wheezy trying to negotiate time with her mm -hmm. and time spent, or she leverages using Wheezy to, you know, take her to a store that maybe her parents wouldn't take her to to get new music. You know, like so she she her relationship to her elder shifts as she's kind of formulating who she's going to be um, in this world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, you see how her relationship with her sister, Sissy, because Sissy's kind of that one who's like, okay, I'm grown, I'm going on about my life. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, how that impacted her as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Sissy, or it's Sasha, but Mika calls her Sissy. Um, so Sasha is five years older than Mika. And we learn in the book that she basically moves out of the house as soon as she's able to. Sasha mm -hmm. does. Um, and and before that is working, right? So she's in the house, in the household, but is working as many jobs as she can. And so that, you know, leaves this void of who's going to watch over the minor in the family, Mika, right? And so that's how she ends up at Redwood Court so often. Um, and, you know, it, I think that the music was kind of the, the stand-in for just the ways in which they were walking two different paths. One was very interested in her people and one was very interested in complete independence. And, you know, Mika had her father being a daddy's girl. Mika had her grandfather being a granddaddy's girl. And there just wasn't for those two, I think, a big sibling story in the ways in which we experience it in a lot of other stories, right? And I've heard, like, that's been a, a big question of like, why was Sasha even there if if she wasn't really a part of the family? And it's not that she wasn't a part of the family. She becomes, you know, she she comes in and does very big loving gestures mm -hmm. for her family. Um, but she just kind of gets on her independent journey a lot sooner. And it didn't include the people who raised her as it did for Mika. 
Right. And that does happen, you know, sometimes in, in families that, you know, the elder goes on and kind of does their own thing. And then maybe the younger feels like they have to walk a certain path because the elder didn't walk that path. So, mm -hmm. I mean, these are the kinds of things that, I mean, I've seen it play out with folks that I know, even in my own family. So I yeah. know about that. And Christina has a comment. It's it's so funny how this story still poses questions as an adult. It's all relative to me now as I flash back to my parents and grandparents and now moving forward and navigating motherhood with my own kids. A great read. Yes, it is. And thank you for the recommendation, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Um, so I am 39 um, now. And someone asked me at another conversation like well what was going on with rena this one moment rena and mika kind of cl they clash and you know what was going on with rena was she grieving and i was like i don't know that she was grieving um me being on the like near side of perimenopause right <laughs> i don't have kids i don't have kids but i did always grow up with kids in the house because of my mother mm -hmm. um so but what i know that is going on in my body right now and if I were my mother's age, um, I would have a 17 year old and I cannot mm. imagine mm. <laughs> <laughs> dealing with what's going on in my body and, you know, a girl trying to figure out who she is and what's going on in her body. Right. Mm. And like, we don't like, and so I was trying to explore that in that moment as well and and as i to christina's point as i get older and, and sort of find myself in the different age ranges of these generations of folks um yeah my even just my like vantage point of who where i'm looking and who i'm thinking about shifts as well mm -hmm. and in that particular scene um i i was thinking about that you know oftentimes there is a clash with mothers and daughters you know, so that part in and of itself wasn't that far fetched. It's just a matter of how it how it shows up. Yeah, right, <laughs> you know, right, yeah. How it shows up, you know, is it arguing? Is it slamming doors? Is it you know? There's just a lot of things that happen because you know they often will say two women can't be in the house together, <laughs> living in the house together, and then you have someone who's trying to be or working towards becoming a woman with her own thoughts and ideas, you know, and then you know the mother feeling like I'm the mother, so you should listen to whatever I say. But then also in that scene, and you all have to read it to, to get the details, I also look at it as it's kind of like the daughter's telling her, hey, X, Y, and Z doesn't work for me. You know this doesn't work for me. And mom was like, well, I don't give a fly flip if it works for you or not. You're going to do as I say, not as I do. So there's definitely a lot kind of going on in there. Yeah. And the things that we do to try to be heard, right? Like mm -hmm. the things that we do to try to be heard. And I think that um, that was very, that was a real important moment for Mika about adults listening to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And adults listening to her. And then, you know, in, in that scene, them, I guess, seeing each other differently, because there were some things that were revealed yep. in that scene yep. as well yep. that that maybe Mika had not known about her mother. So, yes. So, I mean, that's a whole nother thing. It's like sometimes families carry secrets. Yep. <laughs> they yeah. keep things they don't want. They think the kids don't know, shouldn't know, or, you know, they're too young to know, or they just don't, or there's a, a shame or a feeling about whatever. And, and as people hold those things, oftentimes it can come up at the most, you know, when you least expect it. Yep. Yep. And it governs how we, rear children it governs how we exist within the family community unit it governs how we exist in the world right um and like what might it have meant for them and their relationship for that to have been shared earlier mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but you know i also love um the friendship yeah there are there are friendships, you know, as, as young girls, you know, coming up, you have friendships and you might have this group that you want to fit in that maybe you don't fit in with. And then there's this other group that you do fit in. So, of course, we see 
uh, Mika, navigating that part as well. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's in the school space. Well, and she has friends that are at the court that she plays with, right? And that's just kind of the ways in which that community came together. This people around the same age moved in, had kids, now grandkids. Um, but her core like friend group starting to started to develop at school, which is where Mika felt she could express who she was and where she started to pick and choose, you know, the things that she learned from the lessons on Redwood Court. <laughs> um, and that sleepaway camp is really when you see that and and when she's doing her first job is when you really see her embodying um, a lot of the things that she learned while at the court and like taking it out into the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that is really something we all navigate, you know, the lessons that we learn, you know, from home or, you know, in that environment of the people who are nurturing us and raising us. And then we do have kind of to take that and like synthesize it for ourselves and be like, okay, this works for me. This doesn't work for me. You know, I need more of this. I need less of that. So Yeah. So, and I think a surprise to Mika is that she ends up being closer to the ways in which Rena is rather than her father when she's out in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, which I think if you had asked Mika, you know, she would have been like, she would have said, right, that she's close, that she's more like Tita or Majin. I think that's aspirational for her. Um, but how she, you know, is a nurturer, like Rena showed up, right? Like how she, um, defends injustices is what you see Rena do. Um, so that was that was a an interesting um, character arc for me to explore of like what it meant to have someone who thought so very much that they were not like their mother, right? That, that the friction up against the whole upbringing um, to then go out into the world and, and see that she is. Right. So let me, that brings up a question for me just about your process. Now, when you started, I know you had stories that you had worked on along the way, but when you started to piece everything together for the novel, did you kind of know that was going to happen or were the characters talking to you along the way and say, no, this is who I am? <laughs> yeah, the characters do it. So, I, And so like when you talk about character driven stories, right, like I spend a lot of time developing the characters and the mm -hmm. world um and the timeline as like very fixed things and then the, kind of like sim city right then the characters kind of get to feed off of the those um variables mm -hmm. and there were a lot of surprises um when i got to specific moments in writing where i was like i didn't i didn't know that this character was going to do this but like of course they would. <laughs> um, yeah. So no, I didn't. I didn't think that that was going to be be the thing. And that's and love, exactly love, how it's not autobiographical. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. And I, I love that about I guess the art and the craft of writing is that. Yes, you might, you know, you sit down and put pen to paper or, you know, typing or whatever, and, and it can just go, you're like, wait a minute, I wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't what, what I was originally planning to do. Yeah, so there's a scene where Wheezy meets a new cousin, Cousin Daisy, and Cousin Daisy comes to visit um, Redwood Court, and I really thought it was going to just be, you know, two people around the same age, walking off into the sunset together. And it turned out Cousin Daisy had a message for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was very political for the audience that was receiving it. Um, and then I was like, well, how am I gonna get them out of this? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's just been, it's been really fun. 
I love it. I love it. Monica is saying this is such an intriguing story that deeply resonates with my own. Cannot wait to read. And you are welcome. <laughs> you have inspired me to write more deliberately of my own experiences. Yes. Yes. Let's talk about that a little yeah, bit. Sure. What is it about, you know, writing of our own experiences that's so important? Um, who else? can tell the story of who we are, right? Um, I mean, I think that's the base of, base of it. I remember distinctly around, like right before I sat down to start writing the first story of this, and Chitlin Strut was the first story I wrote. Okay. Um, but right before this, my husband and I went to London and there was at the V&A Museum, a uh, like black people in, early whatever century art tour. So we went and did that. And, you know, it was looking for depictions of black life in European art in this museum. And the, the facilitator was a black woman. I don't know of what origin, um, but she was going through and trying to tell us that the ways in which the black life was depicted in this art was different than American chattel slavery and that these folks were beloved, like members of the family. And I just was like, <laughs> is that the story that they would have told? <laughs> you know, and, and, and so that really like one of like, that's one of the defining moments of like, what stories don't we get? Um, how do we get the stories? And so often when we are faced with or given, if you will, Black Southern narrative stories, um, trauma uh, yeah. is the narrative driver um, or traumatic incidents are the narrative driver um, you know, to be a book about a family who know explicitly that they are descendants of the institution of American slavery, and yet that doesn't, that known fact isn't the biggest piece that drives the story, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I just wanted to offer up that there are other ways that we can tell how we got here, how we got over, how we are still here, right? And it doesn't have to be that they are extraordinary or like the talented 10th. It doesn't have to be any of that, that the lineage of this family survived 400 plus years of <laughs> slavery on this side of the Atlantic Ocean is extraordinary enough, right? Full stop. And but also like what lives did they live um, right. and how can a future people know that there were ordinary Southern black folks living their lives despite all of that. <laughs> right. Right. And that's why I even brought up the thing like about them playing spades or, you know, the music or, you know, like you talked about the chitlin strut, which we didn't talk about, but there's oh, that, yeah. you know, you know, there's all these things that are happening in their life around them that shows that they are living full lives and they are, you know, there is joy, there is happiness, there is community, there is family, there is love. There are all of these things that we see. And yeah, there's some, I almost said a cuss word, there's some stuff that pops up there. <laughs> right, right. And I say, you I, know, that you I, have to contend with, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you're walking around on eggshells all the time. There is joy. There is love. There you know, are all these other things. Yeah. I like to say that if I were to try and tell this story without any trauma, it would be science fiction. Right. Right. Because, I mean, that's just <laughs> life. That's just life. Oh, we have, speaking of fiction, we have a question. Thinking in terms of the movie American Fiction, did you have any pushback from the publisher on trying to tell this story? Um, I had a really supportive agent, my second agent, to be clear. First okay. agent did not 
understand this project. Um, but I had a really supportive second agent who went to bat for this project. And I guess the pushback might have happened with who was going to pick up the book or not, right? Somebody picked up the book <laughs> and you only need one yes. We had a few, but you only need one yes. Um, and I think that, yeah, no, I had I didn't have any pushback on there on on that front. Um, yeah, I got the stars aligned. I had to wait a long time because I refused to write a different story. And I had to wait for all of those things to align in that way, right? Um, because the story was finished in 2018. Oh, wow. Um, and it got bought in 2021. Okay. Um, but that was the decision I made. Um, that was the decision I made was to wait so that I could, because at the end of the day, like I have to be proud of, I like, I am the face of this project. Um, I have to go into these spaces and represent and talk about the book. And if it were anything else, I just wouldn't have the same pride. Right. I wouldn't. Um, and, you know, and I also have another life, right? Like I have a whole other life that was not contingent upon me selling this book. And so I had the luxury of being able to wait until the right people got into the right room and said, we want to do the thing that you want to do. And you didn't settle. And Christina, you read my mind because the <laughs> artwork is beautiful too. You saw, I just picked it up and that was why. <laughs> Uh, some things you can't really see be just because of the light. Yeah. But, um, the cover. So tell us a little bit about the cover. Yeah. Um, so that speaks to, I think, again, a team that really said, we want to do the thing that you want to do. Um, and do you have input on it? Um, which is not usual. Um, not usual for everybody. It's not standard for right a debut author to be able to have as much input as I was on the cover of this book. Um, and one of the things that was really important to me was that there wasn't only a singular figure on the cover, which if you were to, um, there's several bodies within the collage of this, like of this, here. of this figure. But um, if you were to just do a quick survey of black, literature, contemporary literature, um, and even like books that were reissued, um, you either have big lettering, abstract art behind it, <laughs> big lettering mm -hmm. title, abstract art behind it, mm -hmm. or a singular figure, no matter how many people focus on the story. Right. Um, and because I really insisted that while at the heart of it, it is a coming of age story for Mika. It is also a collective story of this family. Mm -hmm. um, it was very important that multiple multiple bodies be represented. And so, you know, they worked with an artist, Equa Holmes, um, who is a really just like exceptional book cover artist. Um, and Equa, you know, gave me a few iterations of what she thought the cover would be. Um, and I was like, no, not this, not this, not this. Um, she had started drawing some of the characters and I was like, no, I don't know that they really look like that. Um, and so she had asked um, for photos of the, of the family members, which is something that I use throughout the process, right? It was no secret that the characters in Redwood Court were avatars of the of the people in my family. And I oftentimes used photographs from my family archive to spark stories. So I have a, this great photo of my family playing spades. And I started, you know, I wrote a story around like, what were the conditions of this moment? Um, so I sent her some photos from the archive thinking that she would, um, you know, use it as a jumping off point for the next iteration of the cover art. I never imagined that they would be included in the collage of the artwork. So those are photos from my um, family 
archive. Um, but it really kind of still echoes in my bigger project, which was entering into the archive. Yes. Um, you know, real, true, full depictions of everyday Southern Black folks. Um, and so my family kind of gets to go along for the ride, and that's super cool. I love that. And if you go to her website, which is scrolling at the bottom, there are several where you can actually see like the actual photos that mm -hmm. are on on um, the website. So please take a look at that to see that. And I know we are like two minutes over time, but if you can give me like maybe three. It's all good. It's all good. Four, <laughs> yeah. I really would like to talk to you about, um, about Sol Saloma Acres. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that because you mentioned you have a whole nother life outside of writing I yeah know, it's a part of it so tell us about Saloma. yeah so Saloma Acre still isn't my like money making part of my whole other life but it is a huge part of my other life um during COVID or when my, I was moving back to South Carolina after 13 years in New York City um I had a conversation with my husband about wanting just more land more space this was December 2019, um, we had another house that we were moving into, um, just a normal suburban Brick Ranch house in Columbia. Um, and I was like, I just want more land. I don't know yet what I want to do with it, but I like that's a desire of mine I put out there. And, you know, then COVID happened three months after we moved. And I just recognized how important outside was for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I already had a remote business, so I was already kind of like detached from being in an office space. So my life wasn't disrupted in that way. I actually had to be inside more <laughs> right, mm. because of COVID in the ways that folks already did. But I had crafted a life pre-COVID that was all over the world, literally, Got it. and just outside. And so I just kept dreaming of outside and eventually we were able to do a horseback riding experience on the beach um, mm. of South Carolina. And I just remember thinking that I know that I'm not actually riding this horse. Like I'm on the horse, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. But this horse is so severely trained that like I could say, let's go back to Columbia. And it's like, no, nope, we're going to do this one path. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that I really wanted to know how to ride horses and I really wanted to know how to do that from black people. Okay. Um, I didn't know how I was going to find it. I didn't know a black instructor yet. Again, just putting out my intentions into the universe land now horses, horses need land and I want to do it with black people. Um, and you know, the universe just kind of provided. I don't know how else to say it. Um, a few months, a few months later, I got to start taking some horseback riding lessons, and I just fell so deep, so hard that like I just knew that that was. It just felt like it was a part of my DNA that I finally was able to, financially, time wise, all of, like location wise, be able to tap into, and I had to follow it. And and then things again started presenting themselves. So I had this opportunity to get this property here in near Columbia, 22 and a half acres, not far from where I know my people were enslaved. Um, and then I imagined what it could be like to offer it to other adults, like mm -hmm. the the power of the outside for black people, for black adults. Um, so we show films here at Saloma. Um, at one point there were horseback riding opportunities for the public. Um, I've become selfish in that, in that there, that's my project. Um, but I have gatherings here at the farm. Um, we have trails, wooded trails that folks can come and walk. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. how Christina and I met. Um, she brought a group of folks to come experience, like have a picnic and walk and just be outside. Um, yeah. All right. I love it. I love it. So, you know, once again, 
follow, see what's going on with yeah. Delana and be able to, if you're in the Columbia area, maybe tap into some of what's available at Saloma Acres. So, you know, that's something I definitely would love to do next yeah. time I come up that way or over that way. Yeah, we definitely will have movies in the fall. I We always show The Preacher's Wife around Christmas time. Okay. Um, we'll show this film called The Black Rodeo um, also in the fall and whatever else my husband dreams up. Okay. And Christine says the beautiful joy space. I love it. Thank you, Christine. I love it. Oh, I, well, you said preachers. Well, I just have to give a quick sidebar. I don't have anything to do with it, but there <laughs> is a uh, preacher's wife play that's coming Ooh. out hearing here in Atlanta um, starting in May. I think it runs May through June. So if you all look that up, the preacher's wife, they're doing a play and um, Ooh, I can't think of that girl's name. It's on the tip of my tongue. I didn't it's know about that. But it's another but, gift of the 90s, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But it's got some good people starring it. I know that uh, Loretta Divine is one of the people that's in it as well. And you have characters in your book named Loretta and Divine. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> so that was that was cool. But, but anyway, thank you so much. I thank really appreciate it. You're taking a couple extra minutes just to let us know about one of your other passion projects. It's always good yeah. to see, you know, Black people, Black women that are living their best lives in a variety of ways. And, you know, as Christina said, being able to create joy spaces, whether it's through the reading of your work or our actual physical space that we can come Thank to. You. So I love it. I love it. So if you could just hold on for me for one moment and don't yeah. hang up yet. But All good. Thank you. Um, and we can say a proper goodbye. So thanks again. And I look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thank you, Marcy. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, so that was such a wonderful conversation. And I am serious about going back to Columbia because we still have good friends that live in the area and really be able to tap into what is going on over there. So I look forward to seeing you all here again next week. I will share who the author is um, within the next day or so. I don't know who it is, but I'm going to wait to share it with you all. Actually, next week's show will not be live because the person that I am interviewing does not live in the United States. So we don't want to keep her up way in the middle of the night or the early morning. So it will be a pre-recorded interview, but I do hope that you all will still tap in. So, And there are a lot of great things coming in the month of April and beyond, because this is our year of more in 2024. So thank you to everyone who's here live. Thank you to everyone who catches it in the replay. Please, you know, like, share, comment, all those things so that people can know about these great books and the great Black women writers. And if you are so inclined, there is a Brown Girl Collective bookstore, um, which is affiliated with um, Bookshop. If you go to Brown Girl Collective bookstore, you will be able to find Delana's book as well as many of the other books that we have shared in this space over time. So thanks again for being here. I appreciate you. We look forward to seeing you again real, real soon. Take good care. Bye-bye.